Yeah. This is for you, Brody. Nice cup of Joe. It's probably all creamer. It is. <laughs> <laughs> I went. I I almost made it through winter without having my traditional winter time coffee. Uh, whilst in Oklahoma, when it was freezing cold, uh. You know, uh, Justin is quite the coffee drinker, and he got me back going on coffee. But yes, my coffee is much like chocolate milk. Hell yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's nearly half a cup of creamer. <laughs> and it's... uh, Yeah, everybody comes out with coffee brands. Why don't we come out with a cream, like a tactical creamer? Yeah. Cowdy creamer. I that doesn't sound right. Maybe you have a dirty mind, John. Jesus. Milk milk from real coyotes. <laughs> Today's podcast is brought to you by what's the Warhammer? Yeah. <laughs> uh, War, Th- War Thunder. And Ridge Wallet. Use your Ridge Wallet you to pay for your gold? War Thunder. <laughs> you have the gold. Yeah. With a current economic downturn going into 2024, instability in the marketplace. What's been a safe hedge against inflation? Even though it like, really isn't if you had pulled any graph ever. Um, gold. Gold used to be gold used to be the gold standard. Your money used to be backed by gold, but now it's backed by uh, nothing. Even though, I guess it was Bitcoin. Now it's backed by the uh, entire might of the U.S. armed military service and all of its capability. See how that worked out for the Gaddafi Acorn Gold or any of those other brands. Uh, what are the stupid shit are people hawking these days? <laughs> That's the main ones. That Do I'm... you need to attach a personality to your coffee? Buy our tactical coffee. <laughs> it's like coffee, but tactical. <laughs> it's got a tactical name. Yeah. <laughs> for your otherwise meaningless, boring, cubicle... Like you go go to work every day to get berated by a boss that you could probably physically overtake, and you just drink your tactical coffee to keep you from putting a, a gun in your mouth and ending it all. But, but at least I have my tactical coffee. Tactical coffee brand. It's roasted. They always say that it's roasted. Of course I would, it is. I would hope it would That's be roasted. How you, what are we talking about here? <laughs> oh boy. Uh. <laughs> we're uh, we're actually not sponsored by any of that. Yeah, no, and, we're just making this all up. That's probably why we'll never be sponsored by anything. <laughs> uh, but be sure and check out AlliedMunitions.com or if you're in Midland, I still haven't made the sign. Yeah, it's fine. Midland. LA Outdoors. Midland Go by LA Outdoors. A lot of cool stuff happening over there. Any any special announcements? Any sales going on right now, John? Uh, sales, no, we'll be, camo will be going on sales soon, like February-ish. That's end of the month today, so. Yeah. Next yeah, month, it's that's February. Key. Yeah, one, one day away, technically. Um, no, no sales, we just got some cool in, like KUHL, if anybody's cool. familiar. Obviously, all the new hot shit rolling in from all the different companies. Yep. Well, we have lots of ammo available right now, so if you're looking for ammo, we have it. Lots of twenty uh, predator hunters. Lots of twenty two to fifty, two forty three. All that stuff's in stock. Twenty two arc. Twenty two arc is officially arrived. Which we'll probably do a twelve minute talk on my first twenty two arc. I officially have one built. Nice. Uh, we'll we'll save that for twelve. Everybody always wants to see the guns. Uh, this podcast we're gonna. We're going to talk about the trials and tribulations of my most recent hunting trip to uh, Oklahoma, which was was freaking fun as shit. I Me, mean, I said a cuss word. I, I can't. I can't not do it. Go to hell. <laughs> uh. So I mean, there's okay. So I'm going to basically break like it's like a hunting wrap up. But there's there's one particular stand that made the entire trip. Out of, you know, so anytime I go to Oklahoma, I try to uh, section off plenty of time because you're going to have bad weather. You're going to have days where they're just not happening. 
I'm not hunting a contest. I'm going down there to film, have a good time. So I block off at least like five days. Because like, again, like I said, it's going to be, you're going to have wind days, no doubt, because where we're at, it's very open. You're going to have days where it's slow. So I always give myself plenty of time. And, you know, that's the first little tip I'm going to give you guys is, especially if you're, you know, saving up to go on a hunting trip or planning a hunting trip somewhere, give yourself plenty of time, especially for coyote hunting. Because like, I was thinking about this the other day, like how awful would it have been? If we're just like, we got two days to make this happen. We got two days to try and get some footage. When, you know, that's how a lot of, a lot of people's trips normally go. It's like they have the weekend. Essentially, they have like Friday afternoon, Saturday, and then they have to drive back on Sunday. If you're planning like a, a, a trip, make sure and give yourself enough time. Because, I mean, we were, well, let's see. I got out there uh, Monday night. And I came home Sunday morning. So obviously we didn't hunt Monday. We didn't hunt Sunday. So it was Tuesday through Friday, essentially. Of those days, we had one full day that was hot and happening. And then like a like a quarter of a day that was hot and happening. The rest of the time it was we had two days that were just dog crap because of wind. Like it was just awful. And then, you know. It is coyote hunting. Like that said, we we put a lot of coyotes on film. Uh, I can't wait till these some of these videos come out, which will be on the other YouTube channel. Uh, Fitzy will roll in like the uh, teasers. If you if you follow the podcast YouTube channel, Fitzy as we get them, Fitzy will roll in like the teasers at the end of the podcast. Uh, he did on the last podcast, actually. Hey, you guys are sitting on a ton of footage, right? Yes. So, okay, currently, we have a decoy dog video that will probably come out this week. Now, we've talked about this, I think, before, but I don't know, I'm just going to go ahead and say it again because I don't remember where we talked about it. <laughs> so, the Texas Predator Hunting YouTube channel, not the Texas Predator Hunting podcast. There's a Texas Predator Hunting YouTube channel. And you'll see, like, I, I answer some questions in the comments. You'll see where I comment from. Is in the middle of a revamp. Like I've been saying, like 2024, the year. We're going to we're gonna do some more stuff over there. <clears throat> so a lot of times, bench, like, there's going to be, like, different segments. There's going to be bench top segments on the range segments. And then there's going to be, pr like, premium hunting videos, what we're going to call it. Or so, it's something along those lines. I don't know. So a lot of times the on the bench segments are going to be like, we'll we'll bring something on that we can talk about, as well as show some on the podcast because you got th you got to remember you do YouTube viewers, this is a podcast, <laughs> it's it's primarily like about the audio. <clears throat> like if if I'm gonna I get a new gun, we'll talk about it here, and then I'll I'll do extended stuff with it over on the YouTube channel. And then the range stuff, we're going to get more into long range stuff, long range shooting stuff on the range segments. And then also some other stuff. Uh, and then there's going to be segments called on the ranch. That'll be more of like the white tail management side of things. And again, we'll talk about certain things in here and then we'll, you know, you go follow that channel as well. And that's where you'll get to see more hands-on stuff. Like it's going to be visually you know, the more visual things, I guess, if you will. But anyways, so the hunting videos are literally going to be like as we get time or as I go on hunts and stuff like that. So right now we don't have like a set. Okay, we're going to we're going to release X amount of hunting videos a year uh, on top of this other content. Like it's just going to be like as we can. But right now we have a. A really good decoy dogging video we're sitting on. We have uh, three or four episodes from the Oklahoma hunt that we're uh, we're going to release. It, I don't know when. <laughs> we have the antelope hunt, the pronghorn antelope hunt. We have Tim Spike's trip out here, which will be some pig hunting footage, probably some dove hunting footage, and some cow hunting footage. Uh, 
Let's see. Pronghorn. Yeah, I think that's it. I think I'm missing one. I don't remember. But we're already sitting on some hunting videos, but we're kind of, like I said, we're in the middle of uh, restarting that channel, essentially. Quality control and all that other stuff. But that's kind of like the the future of that channel. It's like it's the it's essentially an extension of the podcast. Like we'll talk about the stuff in here, but then eventually you'll be able to go watch some of the video footage or we'll talk about firearms in here. Then you'll be able to go like this extended cut over on the YouTube channel and you know, all that. So anyways, let's talk about, let's get back to Oklahoma. So it fell on the wake of the Arctic blast or whatever they called it this time. Um, uh, it was blowing. It had already been snowing up there, and that's why originally was we were going to go there to like Tuesday afternoon. We was kind of worried about like getting even more snow and being having to travel that way, so we went in and like changed the plans, zoomed down there. Uh, Tuesday morning it was negative six, John, is what my truck said. Yikes! But Tuesday morning, uh, we kind of just rode around, looked at all the spots we're going to hit. And put together like a game plan, like we're gonna hit this this day, this that day, like blah blah. blah. But the whole time I'm, we're seeing plenty of coyotes because it also, even though it was super cold, it also fell like the first sunny day after the little snowstorm. And the whole time I'm just like, I know it's cold and miserable, and we need to do this like pre. I'm like, we should be hunting right now. <laughs> but I mean, we stuck it out. We still like rode around, looked at all the stuff, made game plans, everything else, which is what we need to do. And we made like one or two stands that afternoon, I think is all we had time for. And I did, that afternoon, uh, kill the first coyote with Eleanor, known to Vortex or anybody else. Eleanor has now taken uh, the first whitetail and the first coyote with Eleanor. And then it took a spill. <laughs> and I'll get into all that here in a minute. But So that afternoon... Uh, it warmed up to a nice, like, you know, single digits. <laughs> I don't know, it was still pretty chilly. It was, it, it was still pretty chilly, but it was nice. Like, you know, if you have enough clothes on, it's nice. Because predator hunting, you're literally walking. You're making like a 10, 15-minute stand walking out. But I will say this. If you don't have enough clothes on, that in that 10, 15 minutes, you're going to get a little chilly. Uh, I had, I always err on the side of not wearing enough clothing because I want mobility. I will say this, my hands stayed cold the entire time because I refused to put on the big fluffy gloves. Like all I had was like my little thin uh, mechanics gloves. Not good for those temperatures. Not good at all. There was one time my whole hand went numb. Uh, I didn't like that. But the the rest of the time, like I would have my rifle up and ready, but I just I just put my hand in my pocket, which I don't like doing because I like being ready. And uh, all the coyotes, well, not all of them, but just about every coyote we called in on this trip, straight to the call, which is awesome for filming. Because literally all I, all I did was I started bringing the call closer and closer. And you'll get, we'll get to why that's so significant here. In <laughs> you know, we're, we're trying to lay down some good footage. And if they're coming, we're going to let them come. Like you, The good thing about filming is, It'll teach you patience, uh, which, I mean, years of coyote hunting. I know when I can be patient. I know when I don't need to be patient. And when we're in this wide open country, which is mostly what was in, so, you know, sometimes we'd be in a little bit thicker stuff, but mostly wide open. You have plenty of time. Like if you're set up your stand right and, and they're coming straight to the call, not going for the downwind, you have plenty of time. Let them come. And like I said, I just kept getting the call closer and closer. <laughs> Cause I was like, Hey, we're here to get footage. We're here to get good footage. Like, let, let's let mouth call some, which we did. You know, mouth called some coyotes in. Also, use the e-call a lot because the uh, mouth call tone board would freeze up every once in a while. Uh, but anyways, first afternoon, I think we killed two coyotes. Uh, I think we only made two stands. But we also, like, we we're like, we should have been hunting all day. <laughs> yeah. The next day, first stand, Right off, right off the bat, triple. Great. Uh, which we did, the wind was blowing like some bitch. And now, it was technically, I think it was only like negative one or two that morning. 
but the wind was blowing really like, really hard, so it made it like kind of kind of kind of brutal. If I'm being completely honest, and I didn't take enough clothes <laughs> on that particular day, so I was a little bit cold. Uh, anyways, first day in triple, and we we're just like hell yeah, and then the wind got higher, and then we you know commenced to making lots of dry sands. Like that's just we stayed up in like the sand hill stuff for a little while, and I'm just like we didn't get the hell out of here. We didn't go get in that you know the river bottoms and all that stuff. Even moving to the river bottoms, we didn't call any shit. Like, uh, we had several dry stands um, down on the river bottoms. We finally had a good one, uh, a three-legged, a three-legged, but with one wounded leg count came in, like a cat. And uh, so we killed four that day. And the only reason why I know that is because you know, we killed a triple and then we killed one. <laughs> and then, and, you know, it's getting close to dark and the wind finally died down. We're kind of down the river. And we're going to some of these stands that I've called in the past that are like 100% stands. So I'm like, okay, your last few stands are going to be like, you're going to be good. Nope. We killed that one and then I didn't see another one. And I was like, damn, you know. It's always... It's it's never like you know you're always like expecting, especially when you're saving places for you know these trips. But this is what it is. I mean, you're not you're not. It's not always gonna be. I don't care what anybody tells you. Uh, you could sit on land, good land, whatever. Like you're always gonna have slow days. Like some days are just not gonna unass the earth and come in to the call. And then you know the funny thing is that's when all the speculating comes out. It's like I wonder if they're doing this. I wonder if they're you know they're mating right now I wonder if you know they're not coming in because they have other food resources right now and you know it's funny to, but that's where like nobody is willing to accept that uh it's just a slow day <laughs> there has to be we have to come up with a reason to justify our lack of success <laughs> but i did like <clears throat> that day we we tried mouth calls we tried e-calls we tried different e-calls it just wasn't happening. Like, it was just a slow day. We probably should have picked up and moved immediately. Like, as soon as we went, okay, so we went first stand, good, and then the wind picked up even more. We made two more stands in the sand hills, and I'm like, we need to get out of these sand hills because I don't want to I don't want to blow through this good country when they're not. They can't even hear us. So we went down to the bottoms. Looking back, being we have access to more land than we have time to hunt, we should have tried a few stands down the bottom and then picked up and moved areas. Cause like the, we have enough, we had, we have enough access to land out there to where we could have moved pretty good ways off and the wind might not would have been as bad, but it was kind of a drive to get to this furthest place. So we kind of just stayed there. I wish we wouldn't have done that. You know, looking back, we should have just picked up and move. And I harp on that for content hunters. It's like, have plenty of land in plenty of areas so you could potentially get out of the wind. And we, we should have done that. Like, it was, it was just windy as shit. We shouldn't have even, like, been messing with it, but whatever. Uh, if they're not coming, they're not coming. So, but we stuck it out because it was already over there. We're committed. So, you know, but I know that I know that day we killed four cows. Now, the rest of the trip, I have no idea how many we killed. I haven't even counted the cows in the photo we took. I don't care. I had a great time. Uh, I, you know, I, I put out a photo last week or whatever of the couch, whatever. But anyways, so the next day, uh, we finally got, it's still kind of breezy, but we finally had a good day. And I may have those two days mixed up. Like it might've been our good day might have been the second day, and our bad day might have wind day might have been the third day, or vice versa. I don't know; it doesn't matter. But we had a good day, um, and we weren't. Uh, I'm going to say we had like one dry stand on our good day, but we weren't. You know, we are filming. There is, we're, and we're not traditional filming where news flash here. Here's a little something probably people probably don't want us to tell uh, when you watch these hunting videos. Any of them, cow, deer, anything. You, if you watch it, and you actually think about it, a lot of the stuff you're seeing is shot after the fact. 
So when it shows the predator hunter, he's like getting ready and he's flicking his gun off safety and you're seeing all that shit. Unless they're running two cameraman and they're filming it in real time, which hardly any of them are, even if they are running two cameraman. All that's filmed after the fact. It's all bullshit. <laughs> now, you're seeing the, the footage of the animal. Like, they're recording that. But a lot of times what they do, when they have success, they'll go back and shoot what's known as B-roll. Which is literally them like, you, you know, you're watching more. It's just like, just go over there. <sighs> then, then, you know, they're doing it's moving and they're shows them flicking their gun off safety. Because even if they don't run at safety, which newsflash, most, a lot of predator hunters click their safety off as soon as they sit down. I'm just telling you how it is. Uh, even if they do that, they'll be sure to show that old safety click because it's the, just the thing that they do, you know. And like all the other bullshit, it's all acting. It's all bullshit. <laughs> I'm not going to say all of it. There's probably some people that are out there that are true to what's really happening or if they're they're running like a GoPro showing that footage of what's happening. Like there is circumstances where you're seeing like real life shit, but a lot of stuff, it's all fake <laughs> except for the animal getting shot. But anyways, we're not doing that. Uh, we got one camera guy. We're going out making stands. We're shooting B roll in between. We're also we're also doing a. If it's slow, we're doing more product shots, like for munitions stuff like that. If it's busy, we're just you know, we're not. We're not running back and forth and stands. What I would normally do if it's it's happening like that day there. I think we have one dry stand. I'm gonna throw out a guess of we probably killed ten cows. Anyway, I don't know. Uh, we had some stands that were kind of further apart. I wolfed it. I completely. This is what I do know. I missed a coyote straight up, flat out missed it, without no excuses. Beautiful stand, good setup, and this coyote like he was gonna try and go for the win instead of following my my perfectly laid out scenario for him, which it would have been. Follow the draw all the way down, walk across the pond dam, and get straight to the sound source, which is the call. He decided to go out in a clear, wide open, which is what they don't like to do, to get a little bit of a cut on the wind, but still it dropped him within 60, 70 yards. I wasn't rushed. Uh, I was already aiming in the right direction. Just got it behind my scope and wolfed it. Uh, I I actually think I shot, like, there was a little bit of brush. And I had a little bit of the chest and the head. I think I actually shot a little bit low, but uh, still a mystery. Like, you know, if you shoot enough, you know when you break the trigger. Like, I, I'm, I did something wrong. That stand, that's the only one that sticks out in my mind as far as shooting. Because I have no idea what I did wrong. Everything felt right. Like, I was squared up on the right. It wasn't like some weird angle. Like I can I can excuse some poor shots for weird angles and stuff like that, but this is literally just like layup shot. He popped up, wasn't leaving. I give it a second because technically this was Dane's kill. I guess you technically like it. It fell within the parameters of him. I give it a second to see if he he was going to shoot, but he was just out of my eyesight to where I couldn't tell. If he even seen the coyote, like he might have been looking extreme downwind. I don't know. And I went ahead and shot. Like I didn't feel rushed or anything like that. I was just like, hmm, pause. Okay, Dave may not say I'm going to pull the trigger. You know, obviously you always give some time to make sure ju- the cameraman's on it. Just nothing happened. <laughs> it, just, it, it didn't die. Uh, like I said, I, I feel like I just shot underneath it. I don't know. But anyways, uh, Good day, a real good day. Again, we if if it but we would have been a camera guy, would have been hooking it. I'd probably and we also like instead of hunting one big ranch, we we're making some jumps and stuff like that. So that's obviously eating up quite a bit of time. If we'd have been hooking it, we probably could have rung out twenty cops that day. The way they responded because they the only down th- the only bad thing was we we're calling it all singles, which you know. Sounds kind of cunty to say. Like, we only had one, <laughs> one draw step. They're only singles. You know, it's not kind of sounds like a kind of a, gr- a bitchy thing to say. But, you know, I was kind of hoping for a bunch of doubles, but whatever. <laughs> you know? uh, 
like I said, we weren't humping it. It was just, you know, doing our thing. We're having a good time. Like, Kyle's responding good. They're coming right to the call. Everything's great. Now, I will say this. Because of how cold it was, at this point, I am cussing the AR platforms. They are giving me all kinds of fits. But I wanted to continue to run them because I was hunting the call while Dane was watching the downwind. So I wanted to run something short and easy. Again, the uh, my six arc with Eleanor on it was giving me lots of trouble, and I don't have an adjustable gas plug in it because I've always I've never needed it. Like it, I've shot it down to twenty degrees here since I built that thing. Never had any issues. It was a little bit dirtier when I normally run them, but like it was functioning fine before I left here. In the, I think it was like sixty that day. I tested them, tested them before I left. But anyways, I guess it's a good thing we're only seeing singles because like almost, almost every time I'm having like fair fair defeats, and uh like you when you like grip it and rip it or whatever you know pull the charge handle, everything's just moving slower. So I think I, not only does like your ammo perform at lower velocities, i.e. lower pressures when it's a lot colder also i think like everything that's a spring you have to think like everything that's metal and is a spring it's going to be moving slower and i think that paired with the fact that it's a flow through suppressor that works really well and the fact that i can't do any kind of adjustment on the gas block i didn't take any extra buffer weights to try and fool that i think everything combined together is why i was having so much trouble with my six arc like i've I've literally never had any trouble with that gun unless it was just so the ASC mags. Yes, I had trouble or if I let it get so dirty, uh, which shouldn't have been an issue, but it was a little bit dirty. What it know it was, but anyways, lots of trouble. They are platforms on this trip. Now I was, uh, doing some final testing on two to four Valkyrie cow and it has a uh, diligent defense. Wolf, Wolf Hunter, so a standard suppressor, if you will. Like, no, it's not a uh, flow-through suppressor. So a lot more back pressure, even though I have that thing tuned really well because it does have adjustable gas block. I think I only had, like, one or two issues out of that gun. No problem, which is also is also spotless clean. Like, I cleaned it and then just shot, like, five shots to confirm before I left. But anyways, so I went to running it. Now, the whole time... On this good day, like I said, we're moving the call in closer. Getting better and better footage. And I tell Justin, I want nothing more than not only... Now that I've killed some coyotes with Eleanor, like at this point I've killed all the other coyotes with Eleanor. I'm like, now I want to shoot one with Red Dot. Like I want it close enough. I want to shoot one with Red Dot. Well, the stand prior to that... Dane shoots a coyote, and it's like Terminator coyote. He shoots it with a six creed, blows a massive hole through it, like right through the right behind the shoulder. I think I don't remember now. He had like quick shot this thing. Uh, we go looking for this thing, and it's in like they got a lot of rain last spring, so the weed height is a big issue. During this trip, like we had to carefully set up our stands and stuff like that. So there's this one thick draw we're in. Dang has to quick shoot a coyote. Uh, he gets up and walks off. We're tracking it. And I have the six arc, which has literally been giving me trouble this whole time. I have my, you know, 14, five, six arc. Giving me trouble this whole time. And I hadn't reloaded my mag all day. So I'm down to uh, precisely two bullets. <laughs> we see the count. I'm the only person who's got the gun. I got my little six R. It gets up, takes off. So I freehand, like a little 50 yard shot. Just again, red dot, body, boom. Okay. Gun jams, though. Like it failed to failed to cycle properly. Basically, it barely even kicks the brass out. 
So I'm over there messing with that, and we think it's down. Again, I just throw red dot on it, 50 yards or so, maybe a little bit closer. Send it, like right in the middle of the body. We're sitting there laughing, uh, you know, talking about whatever, getting ready to walk through literal, almost head high tumbleweeds to get this stupid thing. And Justin goes, that couch running away. <laughs> and we look up and it was running away. So I throw up the shoot again, but it's like, it's too tall. So cramp, you know, we, I'm like, I need to get to the other side and get some elevation because now I can't see in this grass. So Justin is at a higher elevation than us. So he can see everything. Now, it's closer for me to go through this draw to get up on that hill to see this cow than it is to go back to Justin. And Justin's still a good ways from the ranger, so he can't just go over there and get another gun and shoot it because I had multiple guns in the ranger. He's put, telling us, like, you better get over there fast. That thing is leaving. To which, in my mind, is like, how, like, that thing's already got two massive holes blown into it, uh, but whatever. I get across the draw. And have to freehand like a hundred yard shot, which I went to the regular optic for that. Drop it. Uh, but then it failed to eject. So after that fiasco, I put the 14.5 with Eleanor up and said, I'm just going to run the Valkyrie the rest of the day. Now, I think I, I think that day I had my 22 Creed. But again, I'm like on top of the call. I don't want to care, you know. Literally, almost everything I'm shooting is on two, three, four X. Like it's nothing. Like it's 40, 60 yard shots. I mean, tops. So, anyways, I say that, and we're literally laughing about how tough this count is. And we're, and we're like going to our next stand. You know, it might have been the next, the very next stand, or it might have been a stand later. I don't remember. But going to our next stand, we're talking, we're telling stories back and forth about, you know, that one coyote, you know, that had the will to live or whatever. Because this thing, Dane's shooting like just kill them, kill them rounds. Like it's blowing massive holes. And then I shot it right in the big metal with the six arc, <clears throat> with a <clears throat> 65 grain V Max, which was not kind to it. And then, uh, I don't remember where I hit it on that third shot. And it, you know, it squirmed a little bit before it died. So, well, yeah, it's a pretty tough code, you know. And we're telling stories and everything else. So we're going to the next end. So I'm getting the Valkyrie out now, which has an LPVO, luckily. <laughs> but I'm literally telling Justin, like, I want to shoot one with the red dot at, like, five yards. But I can't. Like, this thing's, this gun's drive me nuts, and I don't really, you know, we're dedicating all of our time to hunting, so I don't want to be working on rifles. Uh, even though I have all the stuff to completely clean this thing and everything else, but I also have multiple guns, so I'm just going to take the easy way and grab a different gun. But anyways, so to talk about this stand, we're overlooking a massive draw. Our wind is basically left to right. Our big draw is left to right. We're sitting up a finger of the big draw. Now, the reason why we're not getting deep into the draws is because the grass is way taller in there. It's a little bit shorter up on these hillsides. Well, I'm going to say like 100, 100, 110 yards out of the big deep draw up these fingers. So with the way the wind's blowing and the way the hills are laid out, <clears throat> me and Justin are going to sit at the, the mouth of this little finger. Because again, when you set up couch stands, the ideal is not only be able to see the animals, you also need to understand that they feel more comfortable traveling in like low, low areas, like in the fingers of draws and everything else. Like if you can make them more comfortable approaching your call, they'll approach the call more often, you know, and make them less comfortable trying to go downwind. So what we did was we set up this scenario, just like I try to do every stand, set it up to where they feel the most comfortable coming straight to the call. And with the height of the grass and weeds and everything else, this is about the only place we can get when we can see 
couple hundred yards, you know, a coyote. Now we can see forever, but the grass, like we want to be able to see the coyote. So it just worked out perfect. Nice little finger coming out of the main draw where we think the coyotes are anyways. That's why we're not getting down in there. Another reason why we're not getting down in the draw. Dane is sitting to our downwind about 50 yards and he's covering the extreme downwind. He has a great spot. Good setup. Calls on for literally like a minute. And again, you set up these scenarios, giving them the perfect route to come into the call and feel more comfortable. But this particular day, and you'll have days like this, the counts were uh, hungry, 100% hungry. Like they're coming in fast. They're coming in hard straight to the call. Now, we weren't running a decoy. Uh, basically, I would keep the call off the ground, but not so high they could see it because I want them to be looking for where the sound source is coming from. And I've talked about decoys before, but we'll probably do a 12-minute talk where I sp go more specifically about decoys because it's been coming up a lot here lately. But anyways, we weren't running a decoy. We are running whatever rabbit prey distress on the Lucky Duck. It's coming straight in. And it's not coming through the fingers. It's coming straight across the hill, which is great. Good footage. We have, you know, we watched this thing come in from like 100, 150 yards. And, I, you know, it's tall grass, so he's hopping a little bit and everything else. Putting on a good show for the camera. And at this particular stand, because of how the, the layout is perfect, you know, how I like it, the call is five yards in front of us. No more than seven. I'm sitting on the ground. Because up on the higher parts of the hill, there's not, like, we're not on the top of the hill, which I don't recommend you doing. You don't want to get skylined. There's not a lot of cover. So I'm sitting on the ground next to a yucca bush. Justin is on a little stool so he can be up a little bit higher than me, backed up against another, a bigger yucca bush. But this coyote, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't matter what we're sitting on. He wasn't looking... Even though we're that close, he's not looking nowhere near us. He's looking directly towards the sound source, which this stand, again, I have my little call on tripod, and it's just basically plopped right in the middle of a yucca bush. So it's about a foot and a half off the ground. He's coming through some taller stuff, so that's why he's jumping. He's trying to see. And I noticed the closer he gets, the faster he's running. And I'm like, oh, this one's going to attack the call. Like it, for sure, this one's going to tackle the call. It's literally going to probably just maul it. So I'm excited, and I'm not even like I'm obviously got my rifle on ready, but I'm not on the scope because again, we can watch him leave after he attacks the call. So there's no, and we're trying to get good footage up, up close, good footage. So there's no need to be like on the scope. So I'm just watching. So as it gets closer, it crosses our little finger that we're sitting on the edge of. Now, that's at that point, it's about 15 yards out. I decide that I no longer want it to attack the car and leave. I want to just stop it right there. So I don't do woohoo. Uh, woohoo or woo, you know, whatever, screaming. Rarely do I do that, and it's usually last result, like a last-ditch effort. I do something more subtle, and a lot of times it's just a growl. Just, you know, just something to get them to try and stop. It didn't matter. This cow kept coming. So right before it was on top of the call, I just shoot it. Now, keep in mind, this is uh, no more than five to seven yards away. And, uh, I do, again, this I just get my scope, shoot. Unbeknownst to me, I uh, shot a little bit low. <laughs> and what had happened is it went through the, sh the bottom part of the shoulder and it blew out its uh, chest. Okay. Pretty massive wound because that's these rounds. The Valkyrie Cow Tiro is very fur friendly. But when you hit like a, you start off by hitting a bone and then like the edge of the chest bone. It's going to get nasty. Like, it's not a good shot for fur friendliness. It blows it out. 
And this cow rears up and starts kayaking. The most beautiful kayak you've ever heard. Like, I mean, it doesn't get more perfect. Now, anybody who's been predator hunting long enough knows. Now, I'm a bit of a tender soul as it pertains to animals. I don't like them to suffer, but I'll also, I'll pause for a minute if they're going to call in more cows or fox as well. So instead of immediately shooting it again, it's like flopping. It rears up, starts kayaking, and just goes a flopping everywhere. I immediately just lower the gun and start looking everywhere. Like I'm looking back out in the draw and everything. Like I'm just completely, this is down here. I'm looking out there. Okay. I'm not even focused on the coyote anymore. Now, Justin, the cameraman, is, is trained in the ways of, he comes from like big TV production where you don't show any of that. So he hits stop. Epic, epic failure from what's about to happen. And the only thing I can think of, like, I'll just, I'll just keep telling the story. So, again, I'm explaining this like it happened uh, for a long time, but it literally it went really fast. So, okay, it starts kayaking. I immediately go looking. I'm not even focused on the coyote because, it, like, it went down to the ground, but it's still flopping a little bit, and it's kayaking, so I'm looking. Justin hits stop. He did get, like, all this shit happening, and you'll eventually see that footage the, up to the shot because, he, like I said, he hit stop after it went to kayaking. <sighs> In my periphery, at this point, I see something to my hard left, which is way down the draw. My attention goes hard left. Rifle still facing forward, but my attention's hard left. In my periphery, I see a flash of fur. And what that is, is it's the goddamn coyote about to jump over my right foot. And guess who's just to the right of me, right behind me? And I don't know why. In a million years, why it zeroed in on Justin? It was either Justin or the camera. It zeroed in on one of those and just lunged out, snarling, goddamn mad. Again, with its chest gone. As I see the flash, I like roll to the left because like it's just something coming by you. I roll to the left and I try to literally just like almost touch it with a barrel and pull the trigger. Miss. <laughs> but again, like I said, I'm I'm literally rolling to the left and I'm trying to just like, again, I have the MDT tripod fully extended. So I had to kick the gun to the side for quickness. Just kick the gun to the side to get it low enough because of how close it is. <laughs> As it's coming over my right leg, I just try to like get one in him. Miss. It's literally like three inches from biting Justin as, as this is happening. But keep in mind, Dane's right over there. So as I roll to the left, it's going after Justin. <laughs> it's like, it's fully committed to eating Justin at this point. And in my years of cow hunting, decoy dogging, super aggressive cows, cows just won't die. I have literally never seen one do this shit. This is the craziest, most funny thing I've ever seen because Justin is obviously backpilling at this point. And I, I just I can't stop laughing enough for a few seconds to like collect myself. Because as I roll left, it's going after Justin. Justin's backpilling. Dane's over there laying on the ground, which I thought he was laughing. Like I thought he fell over laughing. But what he was doing is he thought I was just going to get up and go gung-ho. So he's diving down. <laughs> and I I just, I'm like, I got to get around Justin, this stupid coyote, to even be able to shoot it because Dane's over there running around laughing. So I run around and I put myself in between Justin and the coyote because Justin doesn't have a gun. And I do this by just literally running at the coyote with the barrel in his face. And this son of a bitch is literally lunging at me as I'm shooting it. I shot it two more times at basically point blank. Now, what I was trying to accomplish was 
Because the whole time I'm like, one of these suckers is recording this. Like, Dane has already got his phone out. Because Dane's a Snapchatter. And also, I'm like, I put my... I put myself between Justin and the cow. Justin's obviously recording this. I mean, this is prime time gold shit. This cow literally lunging at me, biting, snarling, and everything else. And what I'm trying to have happen so there's no accidents is I'm trying to literally catch it with its mouth open and just shove the suppressor in its mouth. But every time I do that, it would just like it back off a little bit. But so I just, you know, you're not aiming at this point. Uh, you're just literally point and shoot. I point and shoot so that somebody's two more times, which again, these rounds, they're not like super hot roddy, but they're spicy. And they are vomit bullets. And when you're talking about point blank range, they are doing some damage. They're no longer uh, fur friendly. <laughs> uh, so I shot it two more times just looking down the barrel. And it finally give up. Stop trying to bite me. And when I walked up to it, it was still like it, it. It didn't have hardly any life left in it, and it was still trying to raise its head up to try and bark and growl. And I ended, and like I literally put the pressure against its head and pulled the trigger. But this thing looked like a gosh dang cheese grater. Like it was pretty bad. And you know, prior to this, the toughest coyote I'd ever seen was one I shot a lot with a shotgun one time with lots and lots of buckshot. Like it, it did legitimately look like a cheese grater and just would not die. This coyote for sure takes the cake. Like it is the toughest coyote I've ever seen. I don't know what, like I don't know what made it focus on Justin other than possibly the camera lens hitting just right. I don't know. And I, I guess because we we're literally so close. You know, if you coyote hunt long enough, you've seen this. You shoot coyote, shoot a little bit far back. A lot of times it'll go biting at something. Like it, I, what I think it is, is it thinks something stung it or bit it. So it, that's why, like, sometimes coyotes will, will literally die with their foot in their mouth or they're biting their ass and stuff like that. I think, it, like, in their brain, like, something, ow, something's stunging me. I got to get it off. I guess this one was just like that camera did this to me. I don't know. It was, it was by far the funniest shit I've ever witnessed. This cow trying to eat Justin. Uh, so much so, like if I would have been laughing so hard, I probably could have ended it very quick. <laughs> like I'm literally trying to laugh, but also not get eaten myself because this bitch come at me twice, like lunged. We tangoed twice, which he got immediately got a bullet put in him, but. I don't know. That was some crazy shit. And then I, I finally, I'm just, you know, after it's dead for, for real, for real, like I nudged it one more time to make sure, because I'm like, this is the Terminator of all coats. I look at Dane. He's laughing hysterically. And I said, please tell me you recorded that with your phone. He said, I don't have my phone. I turn around and look at Justin. Please tell me you recorded this. I hit stop when it reared up and started kayaking. I said, both of you are fired. <laughs> but by far, the funniest shit I've ever seen. Count, like, I'm sitting here thinking, like, had I, you know, had I been incompetent hunter or scared of the coyote, what, like, what would have happened? At some point, it would have bled out and died. Because, like I said, it had a massive chunk of its chest gone obviously not enough to get into the heart but you know we're talking about a massive wound here what would have happened like justin didn't have a gun like but i, I did tell justin i'm like i don't care if a cow is eating my leg off you record that shit <laughs> i said but don't ever expect to probably see that ever again. I said, because I've been predator hunting for years. I've seen wounded animals do a lot of wild shit. I've seen them attack calls and decoy season. It sh shit gets western, but I've literally never once saw that happen. And I've had cows at the end of my shotgun barrel. Uh, that was some wild shit. It was hilarious. Nobody recorded. So after that stand, Justin affixed a uh, GoPro to his camera just in case. <laughs> Which we did get some cool footage of a raccoon attacking the call. 
and a coyote getting shot through that GoPro. Well, there, there was some more GoPro footage as well of coyotes around top of the call, but nothing attacking us again, unfortunately. Uh, that was that was crazy, and like I said, I'm just um to the point where I'm pr- just in case anything remotely ever happens like that, a GoPro will probably be on me at all times when we're calling them in that close. Like it's probably going to be a must now. But anyways, moving on. That was like that was, you know, we I think we laughed for another hour and a half about that shit, uh, and then. Uh, made jokes, you know, uh, which I, I don't think Justin appreciated. <laughs> I was like, I guess we see where you fall on fight or flight. <laughs> He's like, I'm just getting out of the way. I went running. <laughs> I said, you had a camera tripod. <laughs> I said, no, I said, no shit. I don't care if I'm getting mauled. Leave it recording. Don't ever do that again. But anyways, uh, moving on, uh, again, that day was great. Like we went on, made some more stands, killed more coyotes. Uh, the next day, I can't remember. I think we ended up getting shut down by wind a little early. Had some, it, it wasn't like dynamite, but it was, you know, it was like call one in, don't call one in. It was hitting smaller spots. So There's lots of jumping around. Wasn't a very good day. Wind was kind of high. Uh, Saturday, our last day, we was hoping it was going to be sunny again, which we was happy about. We was hoping for almost a miracle because they were calling for some pretty high winds. The miracle didn't happen. But we played it smarter. So our first stand was close to the river bottom. Called it a count. And then that's when I found out that my 16-inch six arc was not right. So, on this trip, I always take plenty of guns, backup guns. If I'm taking guns for other people, they will have a backup gun as well. I myself will always have at least one backup gun. But this particular trip, I didn't know what was going to get into. I didn't know if it was going to be night hunting with thermals and stuff. I didn't know if it was the only way daytime. And I also had a couple ammos that were coming out with in 2025 that I'm doing some testing with. So I had a, let's just say I had a bunch of guns with me. One of them was the 16-inch 6-arc because I am testing a bolt gun only varmint round for 6-arc. And it's spicy. And I was super excited. Uh, First stand, picture perfect. Coyote's coming right in. It's not coming too fast. It's not coming too slow. It's going to come right up to the call. It's going to be great. This one, however, when it got to uh, 50 yards, I did my little ground because it was like a perfect spot for filming because if it had crossed on over to the call, it might not have been as ideal of a position for Justin. So I ground. It stopped. I pulled the trigger, shot two foot over it. I just go, gun's off. (laughs) Something's wrong here. Uh, It takes off. I try to lower it by a mil. Like at this point, like again, I put the crosshairs dead on. It shot two foot over. I lowered the reticle because this is a Strike Eagle 318 with EBR 7C MRAD. I have reference lines above. Lower it, still shooting high. And on the third shot, I shot barely over it. When I was literally, basically, my crosshairs, my center dot, was basically uh, aiming at the ground at this point. Uh, still shot a little bit high, and then I didn't have enough room to get another shot. He got back to the thick stuff. So I'm like, well, it turns out we're putting this back up. Uh, there is a problem somewhere. And I, I've never had this happen. And I was literally just bragging on this scope because it literally has nicks in the turrets from where I've dropped it through all the... The uh, harsh testing I put that scope through. There's a problem. Put the gun away. Get the Valkyrie back out. Wind picks up literally right after that stand. We go blank stands for several more stands. And I finally just tell Dane, I'm like, listen, we can go back to the house where it's not windy. 
Me and Justin can f- can film some YouTube videos, like bench top stuff. It's not a big deal. And Dane's like, ah, you know, let's stick with it, whatever. Uh, and I'm like, let's just, you know what? I said, let's move out of this country because this is phenomenal shit. Like phenomenal looking country, uh, which you'll see some B-roll of it. Like it's beautiful there too. I said, let's move out of this top country. Let's get out of this stuff because they're not having it here or they can't hear us from one of the two. I said, on the way home, let's hit some of that river shit. I said, get into that thick stuff. And the river had finally had finally defrosted enough to where they can access that water. Now, keep in mind, it's been very cold. And a lot of these animals' water resources have been frozen. And also, there's been some high winds. Down on the river is your lowest elevation. Thick grass, lots of varmints, running water. So I'm like, we need to go hit that river. First stand, we call in two coyotes down the river. Uh, Dane has to try and take a poke through some brush. Brush got the bullet. I had literally a coyote almost on top of me before I seen him because I'm watching Dane try to shoot his. <laughs> and uh, I tried to take one. I tried, tried to take a running shot through the brush. Bullet never made it. Uh, whatever. I'm like, oh. Oh, we're not done yet. <laughs> you know, the attitude went from, man, our last day's going to suck, to we've gotten back in, like, you know. So we pull up to our next stand, and I call it. I go, we're killing a double here. And we called in three. Uh, I killed mine. Well, you can ask Dane about his two. I'm just saying. <laughs> now, I could have killed the first one, but I'd uh, I'd still bet you money, and I won't believe him until Justin shows me the footage. The first one looked like a gray fox, so I just didn't even put I just put my gun down. Uh, then Dane tried to shoot it through the grass, no go. Uh, the next one that came in was obviously a cow. I let it run up to the call, and then start easing back out. I shot in on the run. And then Dane tried to uh, downrange one through the brush. I don't know if he hit it. I don't don't even remember now. Uh, So I'm like, hell yes. We have arrived. Dane, keep us on this river. We're going to close out this day with some good, good action, uh, good up close action. Now, at this point, I had cleaned up my six arc. It had warmed up enough to where it was running. Well, well, John, on that stand where I caught in three, it jammed again. I get failure to feed. And I think what had happened is, I think the spring broke inside the magazine. Because it seemed like a magazine situation. Like I sat there and played with it while we were getting ready to move the next stand. Seemed like a magazine situation. And if, because of the events I'm about to tell you that happened next after that stand, I lost that magazine. So now I can't confirm what happened to it. But I will say this. I literally had a aluminum throw lever on an optic break during the cold weather. Like it was torqued to the proper spec. I'm a stickler for that. It just literally couldn't handle the cold. But anyways... And I'm curious, like, that's what happened to that magazine or what the deal was. But anyways, we'll never know because I lost a freaking magazine. I'm like, Dane, let's go back to your house. I have my other 16-inch, the TPH 6 arc. The Valkyrie's there, too. No. No, I had the Valkyrie. I have the other 16-inch 6 arc. We'll get you set up on an AR because Dane's running this like super long barrel six creed with a long suppressor. Like he's set up for open country and he sees now, like, especially on this stand, I'm like, I'm going to get us in thick shit, but I'm going to call everything in close. He sees now, like he wants a shorter rifle. I'm like, let's go to your camp. Ain't that far away. Like we can see it. It's like a mile. If you cut through the river, if you take the roads, it's a pretty good haul around there. But I'm like, let's go over there, readjust our equipment, get rid of some of these other this. The 16 inch we stomped before we got out of the high country. 
it was on site for two shots, then it was back. No, it was off. It was a one foot low. Then I just turned the turrets a few times, and then it hit dead zero for two or three shots. Put it up, because I'm like, that's weird. Maybe something happened to the scope. Well, I'll get into what actually happened here in a minute. But anyways, yeah. Uh, but it, it's still like it's not acting right and I haven't had time to. Okay, so that one's out of commission. So we're going to go cut through the river. Th- they have a road. They travel. And we literally asked Dane, how deep is this? Because <laughs> we're in a can. We're in a really nice can am. But which, by the way, brought to you by can am. I'm about to. I'm about to talk up this Can-Am. I don't even know what it was. It's a four-seater Can-Am. It's FDA, John. And it's cabbed in. Heat and AC. Uh, Yes. Holy shit. That's a nice machine. Uh, The cab seals up very well. The machine itself is very quiet. Like, I'm sold. For some reason, I want to say Defender. Can-Am Defender. Uh, it's a just a utility four-seater. Has a bed. Cab did. Like, it is the nicest cab on a side-by-side I've ever seen. Like, as far as the way it seals up and how quiet it is in there. And the heater worked gloriously. I'm just going to say that. But anyways. <laughs> Dane's like, I've never seen the river, you know, over this amount in all the years I've been living here. We start out in the river. Now, the sides are still ice, and it's like it's probably four inch thick ice, but it's not enough to hold us because it is running in the middle. We start out across, and we get close to the middle, and it's like, it's like, uh, you know, maybe up to the bottom of the floorboards, maybe a little bit higher. So it's not coming in the doors or anything, but we're breaking some ice. And that, like, I, I asked Dane. I'm like, you know, once we go through the middle, you have to break the ice on the opposite side. So once you commit to this, we have to commit to this. You don't, you don't want to get stuck on ice, like, in the middle. Because I'm sure it's a little bit deeper. Like, as long as we're moving, it's fine. And Dave's like, I've never seen it over what, how deep it is right here. And famous last words. Because we, <laughs> we hit the middle of the river. And here's the here's another... Stupid moment. I was recording all of this, but right as we were about to go to the middle, I hit pause and set my phone down to light a cigarette. Let me tell you something. <laughs> it was deep as shit. <laughs> we nose off in this son of a bitch, and water nearly comes up to the windshield, and we can't back up because we got stuck on a block of ice. <laughs> so we're, we're hung up on a block of ice, stuck in a river like this. Water starts rushing in the cab. <laughs> I'm just like, oh my god! Mind you, like we're 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 revived spirits. We had called all morning, only seen one coyote. It's after after lunch at this point. We just called in five and two stands, and we're like, we're gonna stay on this river and hammer them. Uh, now we're stuck in the river, and water's rushing in. <laughs> so. We're just like, we're standing up in this, like me and Dane are trying to get out of the water. So we get up in the seats. The water's not as deep in the back with Justin, but we, I do have my bag and shit in the floorboard. I'm like, get my stuff, please. We're stuck. We can see the, the cabin. It's about a mile away. Um, so we, you know, we start the whole process, like getting all the shit out and everything else. But here's the little, there's a little interesting thing. So the six arc bolt gun is still in the back seat. Because, like, the first priority is, like, Justin's camera gear. I'm just like, we need to make sure, you know, I don't think we're going anywhere. I don't, you know, we're not going to slide down down off deep or anything like that because we're literally stuck on the ice. Keep it from going forward or backwards. Uh, first priority, Justin's camera gear. Then it's the rest of my shit. I'm like, can you get my bag out, blah, blah, So Justin sneaks out his window into the bed. We get his stuff out, and when I start handing him uh, guns, but before, right before he gets out the window, I'm like, hand me that uh, six arc so I can get it out of your way. You probably can't re- recreate this in a million years, and I don't really want to. 
the water in his floorboard is maybe like a little over ankle deep. Most of the water is on the front with us. When he picks up the gun, because it's like a, it's like a, it barrel down first. It's like a, oh shit, your gun is in the water. Like your suppressor is in water. When he picks it up, I guess it creates a vacuum. And when he hands it to me, like I, I'm getting it by the butt of the gun, it sucks water up through the suppressor in the barrel and water pours out the, the portholes in the action. I'm just like, well, this one's definitely out of service. <laughs> like he just got a thorough washing, which, you know, Dane's got a little bit of water in it just due to the fact like it was in the deep end and all that stuff. But anyways, that like that killed the rest of our afternoon. Like it was literally like we had to, I kept telling Dane, I was like, I'll walk through this river because I'm not going to die. It's just a mile. Like I can get over there pretty quick. And the clothes I have on are, you know, it's going to wick the water pretty quick. So yeah, it has sucked going through that deep water, but I'm just like, it's right over there. I can go change and get my truck. And come over here. Uh, but you know, he had already called, uh, his neighbor to come pick us up, which took, you know, 45 minutes. Then we take the long road to get over there to his house to get my truck. And we got to go all the way back. And then we winch it out and all that stuff. So it's literally, by the time we get everything back to his house, we have time barely for one last stand right next to the, I say house, it's not his house. It's like it's, uh, we're going to call, call it a ranch house. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what he actually called it, but we go and make this stand. Uh, they kill a cow like literally right, uh, right to the left of me, which do the way I'm sitting. I don't see it, but it was like, apparently it come right in front of them and it was good footage and everything else. Cause Justin and Dane set up higher up and I got down low with the e-call and I was literally just holding a rifle. Uh, so yeah, uh, quite a bit of, uh, rifle problems in that cold weather, John, uh, which is going to be a YouTube series this summer. I'm going to, uh, figure this out what to do. In those super cold situations by uh, literally sticking my shit in the freezer and then testing. I want easy fixes. I want to know if like if I take this buffer, other buffer weight for certain temperatures, I can just drop that buffer weight in and it's gonna the system's gonna run easier. Or is it so bad like I need to have adjustable gas blocks? Or I need to know if I'm gonna be hunting in this weather, like a flow through suppressor may not be the most ideal. If I want to keep this buffer weight and like all this other shit. But anyways, that's nerd shit. But let's get to the problem with the 16 inch. At this point, I'm like, I'm slightly sad because I'm thinking my scope failed me. And I've been nothing but bragging because I'm literally, and I'll, I'll uh, eventually take some pictures. There are literal nicks out of the turrets on that scope from where I've dropped it, like beating the shit out of the scope. And it has not failed me yet. So, obviously, when I first get home, I've got a lot of orders to catch up on. So, the rifles had to sit for a couple of days before I started addressing some of these issues and, you know, cleaning and everything else. Finally comes time for 16-inch 6 art. Turns out, some idiot forgot to torque the action screw. <laughs> so, it was just totally by happenstance that it shot, I think, three times on target. And then the rest of the time, that's why it's all over the place. So... As to what happened, before I go on hunting trips, I always clean my guns. I always inspect triggers, everything else. So I break them down to a certain extent, like which the 16-inch six arc needed a good barrel cleaning. Okay. And I have a procedure. When I drop the barrel to action back in, I'll torque by hand. You know, the back and forth and all, whatever procedure the stock manufacturer calls for. And on the KRG Bravo, I don't recall offhand. That's why I keep notes. But it's one of the two. Like, you start with one and you go the other, all that stuff. Time by hand, then I back off slightly. And then I hit it with the correct torque limiter. Turns out, someone forgot to hit it with the correct torque limiter. And, yeah, so... Don't do that. <laughs> so basically, they're probably just like barely 
barely tight enough to where I wouldn't really recognize it until I started messing with it. So yeah, turns out scope's just fine because <laughs> I've at this, at this point I've already cleaned the because that one needed a cleaning bad like I had to basically disassemble everything because it had so much water run through it. That one got a complete thorough cleaning and everything else, put back together, tested thoroughly, tested the scope thoroughly. Again, when I went to taking it apart, like I literally it might have took an inch pound of force to break the screws loose. So yeah, stupid. Uh it happens though. I mean as thorough as I am and I keep notes on everything, uh that usually doesn't happen, but I was in a hurry prior to that to get it put back together and then sh- uh, fouled back in, if you will. So, yeah. Yeah, I messed it up. Uh, but I do have uh, everything cleaned back up and roaring, ready to go again. Now, what this did spur on, like I said, is the, like, I want to... Now, like I said, we will probably cover certain aspects of this on the podcast. Like, this is our... Our tests, these are our findings, blah, blah, blah. But the YouTube video, I'm actually going to show you like me freezing this shit and then shooting it and then doing different buffer weights and buffer springs and everything else. But I say all that to say this. Always have a backup. <laughs> now, keep in mind, like, you don't have to carry as many guns as I do because literally, like, I want to be ready for any situation we might run into out there. Uh, I didn't have to take as many rifles as I did, but at bare minimum, I would have had at least two, probably three. Because even though I have enough stuff, like I carry extra magazines, extra ammo, whatever the case may be, I have stuff to clean stuff with and everything else. I'm still thoroughly prepared for any event to fix it, but I'm there to hunt. So the first thing I'm always going to do is just swap out to a different rifle. You know, if I, if I have more time or more issues, whatever the case may be, then I'll address that situation. But always have backups because uh, shit's going to happen. I mean, you're going to tear shit up. Uh, you know, the, the whole cold temperature thing in AR is giving me fits. That was a new one on me, which I'm also, I don't think I've ever hunted with an AR in those cold of temperatures. I've hunted in cold temperatures, but, uh, you know, the more I sit down and thought about it, it's like, you know, I've always had bolt guns. In those, you know, more cold temperatures. And the rifles, the way I have them set up now, is they're perfectly tuned for where I live and in, in my temperature range, which is typically like lows in the high 20s. You know, gets up warmer in the days. It's West Texas. It's like desert, high desert temperatures around here. Super cold in the mornings, warms up to a nice temperature in the evening. It's like, and with the uh, 14.5 with a flow through can, not adjustable gas block because I've never needed it. And I've never needed it. I never even thought about the spring or the buffer weight until this thing. That has already started me down a uh, long path <laughs> of testing. Because now I officially want to know lots of stuff. And uh, be looking for some 12 minute talks and full podcasts on this very subject. And it's also something we get asked a lot, like what buffer weight, what spring and, uh, what gas length and all that other stuff on six arcs and all that stuff. I'm collecting tons and tons of data, which already had quite a bit on certain things, but I'm paying a lot closer attention to it. And then doing some super in depth testing. I've already fired it up. I'm already collecting notes on that different, uh, I'm starting with uh, buffer springs and weights right now. Be looking for a lot of content over that stuff this th- coming up this summer, more more than likely when we'll start putting out that stuff. Because we are going to – I talked to Sergeant Arms. We're going to come back out. We're going to talk about that with them. Uh, we're also going to do our tests ourselves, and I'm going to test everything I can get my hands on. And I will be able to tell you lots of data on this because I have, we have so many different gas links – barrel links, buffer setups, buffer weights, and like different suppressors and everything else. I will, this is going to be a complete deep dive. This is what, you know, other than having a great time, shout out to Dane, love hunting with Dane, a lot of fun, great host, uh, Justin, my boy, uh, 
it was a great time, but also like it, it always learned something, whether it be about the firearms or the coyote activity and everything else. Like it was just a fun trip. Uh, and I can't wait for you, you guys to see the footage because we did get some phenomenal footage from that trip. Anything else, John? I see you nodding off over there. No, I'm just nodding in approval. <laughs> that, was a, that was a good cover up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, I thought you were nodding off. You're just saying, yes, yes, yeah, preach it, yeah, brother. Yeah. <laughs> Before we go, I officially got the first 22 arc barrel in, have the rifle put together. I did do the same thing with other proofs. I don't know, you know, it's kind of being lazy, I guess. For me, because I do have a bunch of parts to build new rifles, I just took another rifle and jerked the barrel off, and that sounded dirty. Put the I, the first barrel I got in was CAC Industries, eighteen inch. It is a rifle length gas system. I believe it's a one seven twist, but I'll have to get back to you. We will do a twelve minute talk on that rifle because it was a like a one off thing from Stag, aka Arrow Precision. <laughs> Let's be honest. Uh, actually a good looking rifle. It almost, I almost didn't want to take it apart, but I'm like, Oh, it's cool as a five, five, six, but it'll be super rad as a 22 arc. So you'll get to see that here pretty soon. 12 minute talk. It does look pretty sexy. It's like a clear anno slash tano. You'll see it. But anyways, uh, that's pretty much it. John, any final thoughts? We did have a request, and it's okay. One last thing, and I'll shut up. <laughs> it come up on the live the other night, and also Daddy mentioned it earlier. I think this morning. Do you remember uh, Home Improvement? Did you ever watch Home Improvement? I am familiar. The neighbor Wilson, he's always in the fence. It's like this. Yeah. We actually had several people in the lives request that you we get a view of you. As uh, the neighbor, Wilson. And then Daddy, totally unrelated. Daddy doesn't do, you know, social media. He said this morning, he's like, you shouldn't show him off because now it's part of the lore. I know, right? <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but neighbor Wilson on the fence, definitely. <laughs> uh, speaking of lives, Thursday night on Instagram, as long as I'm in town, uh, 7 p.m., Thursday nights, lives. I mean, that's my new time time slot for lives. Questions. That's basically all I've been doing is just answering questions. And there's there's always tons of questions about calibers and all that, you know, all kinds of stuff. But they're fun. I kind of enjoy them. Uh, maybe maybe we'll get a. Uh, you need the hat. I will build you a fake. Okay, no, so hear say, me out. You need to do it like on like one of your other rival review videos. <laughs> you like walk in like yeah. on a set. <laughs> Oh, what's going on in there? And f okay, we'll put the camera over there by the deer pitcher. I'll build the fence in front of your monitor. And just every once in a while, you'll pick up and just see the eyes. Yeah. But you have to get the same fishing hat. <laughs> Anyways, we appreciate everyone. I think we'll wrap it up there. John? Cricket, cricket. <laughs> well, we'll see you guys next time.